Hi, this is your Sabdu Bharti and we are here at Cube Lauderdale Conin Salt Lake City, Utah. And today we have with us Rob Hirschfeld, co-founder and CEO of Rack. And Rob, it's great to have you back on the show in person again. It's exciting. This is a, there's a lot of energy here. So it's fun to get, get involved and see what's going on. Since you mentioned a lot of energy here, so let's talk about energy. Uh, you're the show, it's first day, but still half day. People just finished the lunch. What kind of energy you're seeing? What kind of discussion you're seeing? What kind of concern you're seeing? So one of the things that's been fascinating to me is I've, I've had a chance to walk the whole floor, which takes a bit of time. I, I've, I've worn out one pair of walking shoes already. And um, the vibe in the smaller booths, right? The, the, the gold, the, the, the you know, they, they split, sort of split the floor between the big vendors and the, the rest of the smaller vendors. But the, the vibe in the smaller vendors is actually really excited. There's a lot of things going on. Um, it's actually a little more sedate in the, the more spread out uh, diamond platinum level over here. Um, in part because I think people know what those vendors do. So, you know, we're 10 years in. The vendors that have been at the top of this pyramid are, are really well locked in. They're well-established brands. People know what they're doing. And so there's a lot of interest in all the other pieces that are coming around it. The ecosystem here is huge. And there is a challenge as you walk around of having to figure out what people do and what, you know, what's going on. There's you know, a ton of you know, sort of niche components that are getting added into Kubernetes. Um, the big vendors are trying to consolidate some of that play under but there, there's a lot of motion in how people are using Kubernetes. And ultimately that's the theme of the show, is how do you use Kubernetes? It's that developer experience, the platform engineering pieces, the pipelining, uh, monitoring, observability. All of those are really the, what I would call above the line Kubernetes concerns. Um, and that's sort of echoed in, in how I see the conference being built right now. And where do you see you or Rack and Fit? Because you folks focus a lot on bare metal. How do you look at Kubernetes? Uh, how real is bare metal and Kubernetes coexistence? So the interest in bare metal um, is on a huge upsurge. I, I would suspect it's big enough that it might even pull us into the show. Um, and normally people don't think of the infrastructure side of the show at all. Um, but what we're seeing across the board in talks in, um, and, and sort of it's a parenthetical in a talk. So there aren't any real talks about bare metal, but there's a lot of talks that mention bare metal. Um, and from our customer's perspective, there's incredible drive around how you do bare metal. And that's, you know, for, for the people listening, what Rackend does is we write software that automates bare metal infrastructure. It's software, so we're helping enterprises run their own infrastructure. They do it themselves, they use the software, they own the servers, it's, it's that type of thing. But when you're looking at Kubernetes on metal, that is incredibly hard. Kubernetes was really designed to be run in virtual machines on clouds. And so when companies are increasingly turning around and saying, I want to run this without the virtualization layer, in part because of what Broadcom's done with licensing, in part just for efficiencies or getting AI GPU work done, which is also a big driver for bare metal, they're starting to realize that the need for real lifecycle control, day two operations, ongoing integrations to how the clusters are managed, all of those are real concerns. They're not top of mind at the moment here because people are so used to doing it in the clouds where they have APIs for it. Um, but there's a lot of demand for people to be able to do that work themselves. Have you had any discussions around bare metal here so far? As you said, we might get pulled in. Yeah. So what kind of patterns, what kind of interests you're seeing where, you know, one day we'll see a rack and booth as, as well. Uh, so what we see is a lot of interest in people who have a Kubernetes distro. We would never do a Kubernetes distro. That's a enterprise level decision. It's a developer level decision. And this is one of the challenges that we see a lot in how people build enterprise IT teams is the people doing operations and infrastructure are often very separate from the people who are using and consuming Kubernetes who are building their applications. And so in order for the bare metal pieces to work, you really have to bring along those operations teams in a way that they haven't been brought along before. So just throwing a whole bunch of Kubernetes terminology or making everything work inside of Kubernetes, which has been the sort of the default, doesn't translate well into teams that aren't used to doing YAML and GitOps and CICD pipelines. You really have to be able to look at the operational side very differently. Uh, and so that's part of what would bring us in as a, as a booth would be helping do that translation layer. Because this is really a developer audience. Like one of the, the hardest topic recent time has been you know, AI, Gen AI. Even at the KubeCon, last two KubeCons, a lot of keynotes were focused. 
I am also hearing a lot of platform engineering this time as well. What are the topics that you are, not the topics who have been around for a while, but where you're seeing just the talking, but the discussion that you're seeing is like the excitement is sort of, what are those topics? So AI is still the dominant topic from a discussion perspective. Um, and what's interesting for that, and we should talk about some of the things that, that they're adding into Kubernetes to deal with, with AI. So part of what we saw is a lot, of, a lot of enthusiasm for AI. What you have to understand is there's a lot of enthusiasm, but Kubernetes itself doesn't map fully into AI needs, right? The keynotes were specifically talking about the challenges of oversubscription or overscheduling or conflict of um, work, getting the right resources. You know, how do you map uh, GPUs into Kubernetes workloads. These are things that actually aren't completely answered yet. So there's a lot of conversations about how do I manage jobs and queues and workloads and things like that. You mentioned platform engineering. Um, there is a lot of talk about platform engineering, um, but it's still nascent. They're still defining platform engineering in a lot of cases. How to do platform engineering, I don't think is as much a topic here. And it's, it's actually a challenge. A lot of times this show goes to what? how, what project it is, what we're doing, the, the pro, you know, what, what thing we're doing. They don't spend a lot of time talking about the how. And, and I do think that's a real miss in some of how Kubernetes is structured from an education perspective and what people need. So giving people tools for platform engineering is great. Platform engineering requires discipline and controls and investment and teams and expertise and collaboration. Those are things that, that the companies have to work through or just throwing in a developer portal is not going to actually help developers at all. They're, they're going to find it very limited. Same thing is true with a lot of these AI workloads. What we hear over and over again in the AI sessions is just how difficult it is to build that AI cluster, to get it up and running, to keep it running, handle dropouts and errors. So it's not just a matter of, oh, I have Kubernetes, now my AI cluster problems are solved. There's a lot of operational concerns that people have to be aware of. And we hear over and over again, it taking months to bring AI clusters up because of all that complexity and then keeping them running is absolutely important. And the investment in these clusters is, is huge. Even if you're not buying the servers, if you're just renting the servers, if you spend you know, an extra week or two weeks or a month getting your clusters going on that, that infrastructure, or if you bought the server and it takes you, you know, quarters to, to get an ROI, even begin getting an ROI from that server, it's simply unacceptable. So, we do see people wanting to talk about that acceleration, getting a little um, deer in the headlights look of like, yeah, I've, I've got the servers, I've got the infrastructure, I, it's not running yet. And that, that's a real challenge here that I, I think you know, the community isn't, isn't talking about quite the same way. They're trying to learn, um, but people need help to do that work. And how or if Bracken can provide that needed yeah. help we do provide that help quite a bit. So uh, we, we have behind the scenes, some of the largest AI clusters are, are driven by RackN, RackN automation. And the reality is that an AI cluster and the type of enterprise clusters that we deliver globally, um, that software, that automation is completely portable. So when you're looking at an AI cluster, it, expanding and using the GPUs is definitely an added piece to it. But the proven roads, the, the way we've just been able to completely standardize and have standard processes behind all of the automation that goes into this is a key component. So that, that's really critical. The other thing that we see is, you know, at the end of the day, you don't want to do AI one way and virtualization another way and applications and Kubernetes a third way. So it's really important to find standardized ways to make this stuff work to have routine processes, to have partners who can just sort of lift you through that. Um, you know, the reality in cloud nowadays is a lot of people don't have the bare metal expertise to even understand how they should be running these systems, and there's a lot of knowledge there. Talk a bit about what you're seeing in terms of Kubernetes and Gen AI, mm. and of course, I would like to hear what is RackN doing in that space, because everything has yeah. to be in the context of RackN here. <laughs> This is my favorite topic. But the idea here, of course, is um, we see Kubernetes very much as the foundation for Gen AI workloads. So, and, and, and we, we talk about Gen AI, there's inferencing and there's also actually model, model building. And both of them are going to have Kubernetes as a core control layer. So, you know, we really do see 
that regardless of what type of cluster you're going to build, what use case you have, Kubernetes is going to be a big part of that. But, and, and there is a big but here, the real resource constraint here is becoming GPUs. And you know, Kubernetes is still catching up on how you share, manage, find, control, inventory, those GPUs. How do you keep them patched? How do you keep them ready to, ready to run? Um, all of those things are you know, emerging within the Kubernetes community. There are things that as people look at using Kubernetes as their AI control plane, which we expect people to do, or we already see that being the default decision, um, they, we still have to work through those problems. We still have to build patterns. Um, it's one of the things that we're doing here, right? I have several people from our team here, including my CTO, Greg Althaus. And that's what we're listening for very carefully, is we're listening for what problems do you have keeping these clusters running? How do we help you tune a cluster so that you get more performance out of it, so that we reduce the, the learning curve? How do we reduce those speed bumps? Um, and that's the type of, of sharing and information that really does accelerate people to go. So as you look at using Kubernetes in those use cases, that really comes forward. Another place that we are seeing real acceleration and interest is on this virtualization on top of Kubernetes. And so um, we do see quite a bit of demand on the bare metal side of, wait a second, I want to run my virtualization platform on top of Kubernetes instead of under Kubernetes. Um, and that also takes a lot of emerging technology, right? Networking technology, storage technology, just how you build and manage the virtual machines on top of Kubernetes. There's some really good projects for that. and We're watching those things progress. Definitely something that companies should be planning for as they go forward, just like planning to use Kubernetes as their AI engine. Um, but then putting all those things together becomes a really um, delicate piece. And you know, I can't stress enough, learning from other people's knowledge here is really important. That's what a conference like this is about. Um, and it's one of those things where we're not seeing as much sharing yet, just because there isn't as much experience in the field yet um, to actually do this work. And see, so you said, you know, this is one of your favorite topics, you know, but there's another of your favorite topics. Uh, you may know what I'm going to talk about. Did you, did you feel any shock waves for the whole VMware and Broadcom acquisition and the way the license change? Uh, or you're like, no, there was no disruption here. Or you do hear a lot of discussions where people are looking at alternatives and you are engaging with them and you're like, hey, this is what Bracken does. It's not an understatement to call the Broadcom shockwave seismic. Um, and the interesting thing is I don't think they've all the way been felt here. So, we are definitely having a lot of conversations. We've built actually a lot of really good material to help people evaluate alternatives. Um, one of the nice things is Racken doesn't have a hypervisor, just like we don't, we don't make servers, we don't make a hypervisor, um, we don't do a container platform. So we partner with the vendors in those spaces. So we do a lot of VMware installs, but we install other platforms as well. And so customers come to us as a trusted advisor on which things they should consider. And the the, Amazing fact of the matter here is that it's very difficult to switch hypervisors. It is, if you're using VMware, it's very hard to move to an, an alternative like Nutanix, or uh, we, we recommend Proxmox for open source hypervisors quite a bit. And the reason is because those are architecturally different. Your operations teams have to learn new skills, have to work with different things. They actually buy different servers. They buy different equipment. And so what we found is, it's much harder for, for companies to change direction to embrace a different hypervisor just because they want to avoid VMware. They're, and that's why the Kubernetes as the skip over virtualization has been such an attractive thing. Kubernetes is much more agnostic about the underlying infrastructure. And if you invest more in Kubernetes, you have more flexibility about eliminating or changing that virtualization layer. So what we expect, and, and we really see a lot um, of movement in is companies trying to limit or lock their VMware footprint as is. So they're not planning new purchases, new acquisitions, but the infrastructure they have, they're going to keep running that because it's designed for VMware. You can't just take the hardware you have, throw out VMware and bring in you know, an, an alternate vendor. You can't even easily migrate it to Kubernetes. It's locked in on that footprint. So it's really net new purchases, it's really going forward decisions on how people are working. And so they have more time than they might think to make those decisions, but they do have to have very assertive decisions about going forward, new platforms will look like this. Over, overall, the, the decision is, if I just invest more in the direction I already have, which is Kubernetes, then I'm going to have a winning strategy. 
from a VMware migration. Rob, once again, it was uh, great seeing you in person again, and uh, thanks for great insight. And as usual, I look forward to chatting with you folks again. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the questions about the show. There's so much going on here. It's nice to drill in a little bit.